Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. Also, if you are new here and you are enjoying what you are hearing, or if you're lurking in the back and would like to join, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab your snacks, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads with in this video. This happened last night. I'm still pretty freaked out. We're up at my father-in-law's for Christmas. He lives in South Jersey, in a pretty remote area just north of Bryan State Forest. It's quiet and always a little eerie, but felt especially weird with the overcast weather and unseasonable warmth of the last few days. We did Christmas dinner at my brother-in-law's and got back pretty late. Because of the radiator heat and outside temperatures, we slept with the window open. I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and as I was drifting back to sleep, I heard a low wail building in volume for a few seconds before stopping abruptly. I figured it was just an old sounding bird and tried to go back to sleep. It happened twice more over the course of maybe five minutes. I was basically able to put it out of my head and started drifting back to sleep when I heard a loud, shrill blast like a too high elephant's trumpet. At that point, I shot up, heart racing. I knew I had to close the window and took a beat to build up to it. When I dragged myself out of bed, I peeked through the shutters before I reached to shut the pane. Whatever it was had tripped a motion sensor light at the back of the property and was half illuminated, standing maybe a hundred feet from the back door right at the tree line. It was cloaked with its head partially shrouded. The bottom of its face looked flat and round like the back of a dinner plate, with another smaller, half uncovered black circle at its center. I immediately slammed the window shut and it didn't move. Just stood there with its face tilted towards the window. I shut the blinds and crept into bed and basically hid until the sun came up. I didn't hear any more sounds. I dared another look out the window after dawn and the figure was gone. And I managed to drift back to sleep for a few more hours. Has anyone seen anything like this or know what it might be? Frantically Googling, but nothing really is coming up. Circa 2012 to 2013. Me and my homie, ages 13 and 14 respectively, we out exploring a patch of woods at the edge of my hometown in northern Minnesota. We went in a bit deeper than we usually did and spotted a well-built tarp shelter. Being the tactical tweens that we were, we snuck up to it from different sides with a BB gun and a knife and called out, to which there was no reply. We went inside and found some clean tin cookware and utensils on a little handmade counter shelf thing. We came back the next day and the shelter was destroyed. The tarps were cut up and there were stab marks in the cookware. I still wonder to this day whose shelter it was and why it was destroyed like that. Quick edit. Also, I'm thinking of asking the only two unhoused people in town that I know of if they have any ideas what could have happened. Working theory is that some other little shits like us were out there and decided to fuck up this person's camp.
For starters, I grew up in Southwest Saskatchewan and moved into my aunt's farm in 2019 to live in the other house that is on the property. The house is fairly old, but I loved it. It wasn't long after I moved in though that I started to feel uneasy in the house alone. I would close every window when it got dark as it felt like something was watching me through them every night. Eventually, I decided to get a puppy to keep myself company when my boyfriend at the time was at work or away from the house. It helped to have company, but I always dreaded having to take her outside when it was dark. For a bit of scene setting, our house sat on the left side of the gravel road. At the back of the house, there was about 10 meters of backyard, and then there was the cow pasture and the cow barn. We didn't own cows, but in the summer, another farmer would rent our pasture space, and so we would have them on the property. It wasn't uncommon at night to hear coyotes surround the farm either, and there were tons. Every so often when I'd go out with my puppy, we'd hear them all around us, too close for comfort. We had a farm dog too, who would keep the coyotes away for the most part as she was huge. But every so often she'd wander elsewhere on the property to scout and the coyotes would get a little too close for comfort. They always tried to lure my puppy out to them, but luckily I kept her leashed. Now. One thing you should know about my pup is that it takes her forever to find a spot to go body. This is still a problem today, four years later, but back then it was the bane of my existence. She would pace for at least five minutes and that was only after finding a suitable spot. Sometimes we would be out there for damn near half an hour just so she would go and not go in the house, another problem of hers. Huskies, am I right? On this particular night, it was raining pretty heavily. I was not happy to be out there, and she had decided that she wasn't going to go until she found her perfect spot. We had already been out for 15 minutes, and at this point, she was also getting frustrated with the rain and wanted to go inside, but I wanted her to go before we went in since we had already been out there for so long. So, as any annoyed puppy mother would do, I started getting a little frustrated and would repeat, come on, go, go potty, every time she'd get distracted from her objective. It was dark, I was cold and annoyed, and to make matters worse, the cows behind us were busting fairly loudly. This was out of the ordinary for them. They were usually quiet and sleeping at this time of night. I was also hearing what sounded like a strange bird whistling, but shook it off, probably being an owl. I tried to keep it off my mind as I kept shouting and pleading, go, through the rain to my small fuzzy white asshole. I was facing away from the pasture and suddenly in my left ear I heard it. Go. Now, one thing you should know about me is I have a very strong flight response typically, but this froze me on the spot as I was mostly confused at what the fuck I'd just heard. I tried telling myself I didn't hear it. I tried telling myself that it was just a move from a cow that I heard wrong, but again, as if spoken directly behind me, I heard it once more. Go. Go. It sounded unnatural. It was as if it came from someone who had never spoken a word before. A raspy, deep monotone. Go. It also sounded like it was coming out of an old radio. But of course, there were no radios out there. Every time it said it, it sounded the exact same as the first time it was said, and whatever it was had started repeating it as if it had been taught its new favorite word. At this point, I spun around to the pasture to find nothing there. Then again, 
from behind me. Go. This had all happened in the span of about three seconds, and at this point, I remember shouting out loud, All right, don't have to tell me twice, as I picked up my little furball and made a mad dash to my front door. I swiftly locked both doors behind me and sat bewildered in my kitchen. Puppy went back to puppying immediately, obviously unbothered by it all and Happy Mom wasn't making her stay out in the rain any longer. I picked up my phone and called my aunt, asking her if my uncle had been out in the field with the cows. She said no, and I explained to her what had just happened to me. She sent my uncle over to the pasture to check it out, but soon after told me he hadn't seen or heard anything. He said he checked the pasture again in the morning. I spent my night hiding from the windows, with the lights and TV on, loud enough to not hear anything outside. The next morning, when my uncle checked on the pasture, he found two calves dead. Explains the colossal cow panic that had ensued the night before. I regret this, but I didn't push for more information as I honestly just didn't want to know. But they told me rather than that, they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. A few months later, I moved off the farm. I couldn't be in that house alone anymore, and my boyfriend and I parted ways. A few months after that, I started going to therapy for the paranoia this has caused me. I started feeling like people were watching me, out to get me. Another few months after that, I moved out of the province for good and finally left safe. I'm wondering if any of you have any idea what the hell this could have been. There's no chance there would have been someone in our field as we were fairly far away from town and neighbors, and we have cameras that would have seen anyone enter our property. Coyotes are common, but I don't think they are capable of mimicking words. Any ideas? Now, since moving, I've had some weird related things happen as well, but I better save that one for another time. This story happened just this summer. I'm only now getting around to writing it down and sharing it with you. I would consider myself an outdoorsman, I grew up in the sticks. I've spent a lot of my life wandering in and enjoying the backcountry. I'm older now and have settled down in the suburbs. Wife, two boys, a house, a dog, a desk job, the whole suburban shtick. I want opportunities for my kids that come from suburban life, but I also want them to grow up with an appreciation for the outdoors. So, when my oldest son was big enough for his first solo father-son camping trip, I was excited. My wife and younger son stayed home for this midsummer trip. It was going to be a great bonding experience for me and my son. Because my son is just five, I didn't want to do anything too extreme on our first big solo camping trip together. We needed a place that wasn't too deep into the Colorado Front Range, but still allowed for dispersed camping. I don't consider camping in RV parks or established campgrounds to be actual camping. You might as well be at a motel watching TV. Camping, at most, is a tent, sleeping bag, and a fire. A dispersed camping area called Gordon Gulch, west of Boulder, caught my attention. I had never been to this area before. There were no facilities and it was dispersed enough you couldn't see or hear any other campers nearby. My son and I had a blast that day. We set up camp, collected firewood, went for a hike, saw a moose and a bobcat, tried a little fishing, and finally, as the sunlight faded, we returned to our campsite to light a fire. We had a traditional and nutritious camping meal of fire-burned hot dogs and marshmallows. It was a good day. Definitely a good core memory for both my son and me. 
the perfect first camping experience for a preschooler. Or so I thought. After all that fun, my son and I were exhausted. It was time for bed. The sound of an evening summer breeze through the pines is better than any commercial sleep aid. I don't even remember drifting off. It was a hard, dreamless sleep that only physical exertion can bring. One thing about my son, he inherited many things for me. Hair color, eye shape, disposition, and my unusually wide feet. But one particular thing he got from his mother was sleep talking. It's not unusual to hear him having full conversations in his sleep. It gets more pronounced when he's overly tired. I was catapulted out of the void of sleep. Not sure what aroused me. I set up collecting myself. The world seemed to be at peace. It was quiet. Just me and the breeze through the treetops. I couldn't figure out what woke me so suddenly. The sound of my son laughing in his sleep cut through the groggy confusion. It was a deep belly laugh. Must be a fun dream, I thought hazily. Gently rocking him was enough to quiet him down. That must have been what startled me, I determined. As I repositioned to fall back to sleep, my son burst out laughing. I sighed and closed my eyes. He'll quiet down soon enough, I thought. He laughed again. This time, his laugh was echoed by something outside our tent. I held my breath and listened, unsure of what I had just heard. It wasn't an echo. There was something out there, and it was laughing in unison with my son. My grogginess vanished as the adrenaline began to pump. It couldn't be real. It had to be my imagination. I sat up in my sleeping bag, listening to the night, hearing nothing after a minute. My muscles finally relaxed. I started to settle back down. Must have been hearing things, I thought. I was tired, after all. Checking the time, I saw it was four in the morning. The sun would be up in a couple of hours. My son laughed again, and again it was answered with laughter outside. I was now absolutely certain it was not an echo. As I tried to make sense of what was happening, the voice outside called out my son's name. My blood ran cold. That voice, it was so familiar. Then it clicked in my brain. It was the voice of my younger son. That wasn't at all possible. He was safe at home with my wife, miles and miles away. I could hear twigs crunching beyond our thin nylon tent walls. It was impossible to tell the distance from us, but there was something out there, circling us. Unprompted this time, it called out my son's name in that little toddler voice. My five-year-old son, still fast asleep, called out to his brother, asking him to play. The thing outside the tent laughed in reply and urged my son to come outside. That thing with my little son's voice sounded cold, hollow, dead. The floodgates of my adrenaline burst open. Cold sweat formed on my face. I was frightened out of my mind, but my primal caveman brain roared to life. I was in Papa Bear mode. Nothing was going to take or hurt my son. I was putting a stop to this right now. Whatever it was out there, I didn't care. You don't mess with my kids. Say what you will, but when you're camping miles from anything, it's not worth the risk of being unarmed. Wild animals, wild people, you have to be prepared. I almost always take a firearm with me when I'm camping. Pepper spray and bear bells are great, but nothing gets attention from a conscious threat faster than the sound of chambering around. I spoke loudly into the night that I had a gun and was coming out. 
I hoped the fear in my voice was masked by my aggressiveness. The only reply was the breeze through the treetops. My son was still asleep. Kid's a hard sleeper. Another trait from his mom. My wife and I have joked that he could sleep through a tornado. Stepping out into the cool summer night, a gun in one hand and a flashlight in the other, I surveyed the campsite. The fire was down to embers. Our fishing gear was leaning against the pickup. The firewood was still neatly stacked. Nothing seemed out of place. Not wanting to stray far from the tent or my sleeping son, I sat down outside the entrance. I waited in the dark with the flashlight off. Not far into the trees, I heard a branch break. Then another snapped, this time closer. I stood up and flashed my light in the direction of the sound. Nothing was there. The voice called out, this time from behind, and this time focused towards me. Daddy, Daddy. It was my youngest son's voice again, crying out for me from the dark forest. I threw the light beam in that direction. A pair of shimmering green eyes were illuminated by my flashlight. They were only two or so feet above the ground, the same height as a toddler. I took a small step toward it. I wanted to see more. I needed to see more. The eyes, unblinking, remained in place. Getting closer didn't help reveal this thing. It seemed to absorb the light from my flashlight, almost devouring it. I couldn't make out its size or shape or color. It seemed to swallow up all the light around it, save for its two shimmering green eyes. That thing laughed in its hollow toddler's voice, this time with malice and cruelty in it. The eyes never looked away from me, never blinking, focused only on me, like a predator before the pounce. Not wanting to give up any ground to a predator, I stepped forward again. It didn't move. Not knowing what to do, I screamed as loud as I could. I waved my arms, trying futilely to shoo it away. The eyes shimmered, and as I stared back, the eyes shifted from green to amber. I watched as they began to rise up into the air. It was now apparent to me this thing had been crouching and was now standing up. I could only watch in silent terror as the eyes finally stopped rising nearly ten feet off the ground. The night air erupted with a deep growl. I could feel the vibration in my gut. I couldn't see a mouth, but I could hear teeth snapping and gnashing. My son in the tent behind me began to scream. That was the only time the eyes lost focus on me and shifted towards the screams of my child. My only reaction was to fire my gun into the air. The eyes immediately vanished. My ears were ringing, but I could hear the growls turn to shrieks, followed by a cacophony of crashing branches and undergrowth. I stood there until I couldn't hear the shrieking anymore. It trailed off deep into the trees. I was left with only the sound of the breeze in the treetops and the quiet sobbing of my kid. Twilight was beginning to illuminate the forest. Shaking and exhausted, I sat down in the dirt in front of the tent. I tried to collect myself. Daddy, Daddy, where are you? My five-year-old shouted. That got me out of my daze. I picked myself up and went into the tent to retrieve him. Putting him in the truck, I locked the doors and wasted little time breaking down camp. We were out of that camp and back on the road by the time the sun broke over the horizon. I had no idea what was in those woods. I do plan to camp in that area again, albeit without my family, and definitely with some friends. I want to find out more about this thing. Thankfully, my son doesn't seem phased by anything that happened that night. 
He thinks I was chasing a bear away from the camp. And maybe he's right. I hope he is, anyway. My son can't wait to go on another camping trip. But truthfully, I'm thinking the next family camping trip might be at an RV park or even a motel. That's family camping, right? There is a little hot springs nestled near the park of the Pesimeroy Pass in central Idaho. Though it is hidden in plain sight, sitting quite literally on the shoulder of the road, it is not a well-known attraction outside of the valley. But the local ranchers are quite familiar with Barney Hot Springs. It's not unusual to drive by on the weekends and see several families enjoying the water. Barney Hot Springs, or simply Barney's, is incredibly remote, even for Idaho standards. It's at least an hour of driving over ruddy dirt roads to the small town of Salmon to the north. If you need a hospital, it's over two hours to the regional hospital in Idaho Falls to the south. To say you're in the middle of nowhere at Barney's is an understatement. But the seclusion is one of Barney's major drawing points. That and the odd abundance of tropical fish swimming in the year-round warm waters. You can sit back, relax, and take in the surrounding views of the mighty Rocky Mountains with little in the way of distraction. But Barney's isn't at all it seems to be on the surface. An event 40 years ago turned this little hot spring from a local retreat to a local nightmare. On the afternoon of October 27th, two truckers stopped to fuel at my parents' gas station and cafe in Howe, Idaho. They were hauling a load of hay over the Passamory Pass headed for a delivery point somewhere in Utah. As the truck fueled, the two men settled down at the cafe counter and ordered coffees. Sipping his coffee, the elder trucker struck up a conversation with my mother and the regulars in the cafe. He seemed a bit on edge, but was normal in comparison to his younger partner. The young man was clearly shaken and didn't say more than a quiet, yes ma'am, or no ma'am, to my mom. He kept his attention on the cup of coffee he cradled in his shaking hands. As the older trucker and the others conversed, he brought up a peculiar event that had happened to them that afternoon. They had crested the Pesimeroy Pass and were coming down into the Little Lost Valley. As they approached Barney Hot Springs, standing in the middle of the road was what looked to be a child. Bringing the truck to a stop, they soon realized in horror and fascination what was before them. It was not a child, but an odd, humanoid creature. Its body was slim, with long, slender limbs and a little, squat torso. The head and eyes were large and amphibian-like. It was not standing any taller than a preschooler. They could see its green skin shimmer in the brilliant midday sun. Dripping with water, it was clutching a large bundle of what could only be described as hundreds of eggs. The creature watched the truck come to a stop, then awkwardly walked over the rest of the road and down an embankment. It was obvious from the trail of water it left behind that it had just come from Barney Hot Springs. On the other side of the road was a small stream hidden in dense willow bushes. No sooner had the creature disappeared, the two truckers were driving away as fast as their Cummins engine would take them. My mom and a few regulars at the cafe took in the man's story with silent, somber expressions and comforting head nods. This wasn't the first time strange things have been witnessed in the Little Lost Valley. Of course, a frogman carrying his brood certainly was the most unique story they had heard in a long time. The regulars told the trucker not to get too worked up over the incident. 
as it could have been the autumn sun playing tricks on their eyes. The reassurance seemed to calm the men. They finished their coffees in a few quick gulps and headed out the door. My mom and the regulars had a good chuckle over the men's story and went on about their day. The following morning, on October 28th, one of the largest earthquakes ever recorded in Idaho struck the area. The Borat Peak earthquake was a magnitude 7.5 and could be felt hundreds of miles away. It destroyed farm infrastructure, roads, and bridges. It even killed two children on their way to school when a brick building in Chalice, Idaho collapsed on top of them. It was a horrific and frightening day for everyone in Idaho. Barney Hot Springs was not far from the earthquake's epicenter and did not escape its wrath. A couple passing visitors near the spring that morning watched in amazement as the water drained into the earth, leaving behind a stinking, mucky hole. Minutes later, to their further astonishment, the water came splashing back into the depression, but was now boiling hot. It was a true, bizarre, geologic event to see. The boiling stopped immediately after the earthquake ceased, and the water at Barney's quickly cooled. It's now more of a warm springs, having permanently lost about 15 degrees of temperature after the earthquake. The Frogman has been seen a handful of times since that initial sighting, always near Barney's and almost always standing in the road. I like to think the Frogman was just a dotting parent getting their babes out of harm's way before the earthquake struck and annihilated everything in the hot springs. Barney Hot Springs is still a wildly popular spot for the locals. No one seems too bothered by the idea of sharing the water with little odd amphibian man and his family. Someone even reintroduced the tropical fish after the boiling incident killed all of them. It remains just one of the many weird stories to come out of the Lost Rivers area of Idaho where I grew up. This happened when I was much younger, so details may be a little shoddy, but honestly, I remember it like it was yesterday. I live in Australia, and we don't have much woodlands here besides a few that span on for a couple hundred acres or so. Nothing like what Americans have. And when I was younger, I'd get lost in these woods a lot, and sometimes even sleep in them for a couple of days, at most, surviving off fish and creek water. I never had any creepy encounters besides this one time. I was about 10 years old, and just like I do at least once every two to three years, I'd gotten lost in the woods again. I was completely fine during the day, as I had eaten an hour prior to realizing I had no fucking idea where I was. So, I had the old, ah, shit, here we go again, moment, and decided to walk around to find some sticks to make a little fire. I knew a lot about outdoor survival, as my family went camping a lot, and I watched videos on YouTube all the time, since it interested me and I love the woods. I had set a little fire up as it started getting dark and was about to put out my fire before I saw a small deer on the tree line, just nearly out of range of my fire's light. It was staring at me, which gave me some chills, but I just went, oh, a little deer, and I waved to it. The deer scurried off into a bush behind it, and I couldn't see it anymore. Then, I heard this really weird noise, like twigs snapping, and all of a sudden, a much larger deer came out of the same bush I just saw the small one jump into. At this point, I knew something was off, so I stood up and stared at the deer as it stared back at me, and I was mentally preparing myself for the idea that this thing could run at me. I was a little kid. The fuck am I supposed to think? 
The deer started walking a bit towards me, and I backed up a little and crouched down. But as the deer kept getting closer and I kept backing up, I looked down and realized this fucker had a hoof directly in the fire and wasn't reacting to it at all. This creeped me the fuck out. I mean, his fur was burning and it was starting to burn its skin, but it just wasn't reacting. I immediately set off bolting, but I heard it coming behind me, not really running, but fast enough to keep up with my little legs. I came over this small hill and jumped down into a bush to try and hide from it. And that's when it happened. The scariest shit I've ever seen in my entire life, and I remember it so vividly. The deer's silhouette against the moonlight appeared, and as I stared at the deer, it let out this blood-curdling call that I've never heard from any other animal before. And all of a sudden, the silhouette started caving in on itself. I could hear its bones snapping and flesh ripping, and this thing just kept getting smaller and smaller. Then suddenly, it got much bigger, and I closed my eyes because I just couldn't watch anymore. When I opened them, there was a man standing where the deer stood, or at least the silhouette of a man. He was looking around and then started calling out in this creepy, almost distorted voice. Hello? Hello? And he repeated this for about 10 minutes while I just sat there in silence, refusing to answer whatever the fuck stood just a couple meters above me. The man then just walked off into the trees, and I heard that same awful snapping noise before it eventually faded away. I didn't sleep that night. I stayed in that bush the rest of that night, terrified that this thing could still be lurking around the area, waiting for me to appear again. Once the morning came, I walked a straight line until I reached a road I recognized, and then I ran home. I didn't tell my family about it as I feared I wouldn't be taken seriously, but I was terrified. I haven't been into the woods since that day, and always stayed home when my family went camping after begging them not to go. I'm 21 now. That incident was 10 to 11 years ago and I still remember that silhouette and the noise of the bones snapping. I've done tons of research, and my only conclusion to what happened is that I nearly escaped a skinwalker. I'm tearing up from fear as I write all of this, remembering that horrific night. I hope you all enjoyed my retelling, and if anyone has any other explanations on what this could be, I'm all ears. I was hunting for black bear one day, back in the early 2000s. The area I was hunting in was northern Clinton County. My ex-brother-in-law and I enjoyed the area and spent many a season scouting and hunting these lands. This part of the county is filled with long hollows, steep inclines, and hard to access trails. We both like to do our own thing and hunt separate terrains. I would often dive down into the hollows where he sourced the ridge lines, hoping to get a shot at whatever I pushed over the tops. We both carried pretty bumped up two-way radios to keep a general idea where we were, although often the terrain made it too difficult for good reception. This day was a typical Pennsylvania bear season day. It was on the Wednesday of the season third and last day of the brief season it was back then. The woods were quiet, with no distant whooping and yodeling of various opening day camps pushing drives through the woods. The weather was cold, gray, and windy when we separated to begin our hunt and continued on throughout the day. I spent the day still hunting down this long hollow south of a little town in north central Clinton County 
with the idea of meeting my brother-in-law at the top of a ridge at the agreed time of 4 p.m., giving us plenty of time to hike together a few miles back to his truck. After hunting all day, I found an old game trail that appeared to meander its way back up the ridge line towards where I know he would be waiting for me. After close to an hour, maybe around 3.30, I made my way two-thirds of the way up to the top, stopping often scouring the slope for that jet black fur of a roaming bear. Along the trail, I came upon a long ago used fire ring. It was very rudimentary in its build and appeared to be used maybe once. The ring's rocks were covered in lichen and only had the faintest of traces of black from a long ago fire. I found it odd that a fire ring would be here, considering the steepness of the slope, but it was a very small, somewhat level ledge. There, I figured I would sit and eat the rest of my packed food and sit still, hoping to catch a final glance to see a bear. All the while, it felt odd, somewhat unwelcoming, like I shouldn't be there. Almost felt like I was a forbidden interloper on someone's valued spot. I sat fro maybe 20 minutes and thought that it was my time to continue the trek upward to my bud. As I stood, I slung my backpack on and reached down to sling my rifle over my left shoulder. As I stood up, I heard my name called loudly. It didn't really sound like it was behind me, rather all around me in my head. Just as I was going to turn around, my rifle was slapped off my shoulder. I felt the force heard the sound of something slap against the wood of the stock and crouched quickly to save my gun from dashing into the rocks at my feet. I grabbed it in a nick of time and quickly turned around with a mouthful of motherfuckers for whom I thought was going to be my brother-in-law jacking with me. There was nobody at all there. Absolutely no way could anyone had rushed off without me either seeing or hearing them. I felt a sick feeling in my churning stomach, chills throughout my body, muttered a few Hail Marys, and sped up to the top of the ridge, met my bud, and quickly we hiked our way out of the woods to his truck in the spreading dark of evening. This has bothered me for years, and I have not been back in those particular woods since. Someday, I do hope to return. I could give you a million times as a kid and young adult, I felt scared or paranoid playing in the woods. It's a beautiful place, and I spent my entire childhood getting lost, not literally, out there by myself or with some friends. As kids, we never got too far out there, but you could actually see the progression of us venturing further and further out as we got older because of forts and carvings we'd leave. This one particular time, like a thousand times before, my friend and I had just graduated high school. It was our last summer of freedom, and we spent the entire summer camping and hiking out there we had decided to try and find a new place to set up camp and walk for what felt like a few miles before we came to a nice clearing. The area was relatively new to both of us. We got the camp set up and fire going and the plan was to wait until nightfall, smoke some weed and play Monopoly. For sake of backstory on my friend and I, my buddy is a smaller, real goofy guy but comes from a family of foresters and always had a deep understanding of all the trees and different plants you'd come across. He had no fear of going and camping out by himself. If I spent 10,000 hours in the woods, he'd probably spent 50,000. As for me, I am a taller, sturdier guy. 
And as we got older, I spent more time worried about women and sports, and the woods became a place for small parties. Also, I never had the balls to camp out alone. In fact, older me wouldn't go as far at all when I was alone, because I could never shake the feeling of being watched, which was just paranoia, but still an uneasy feeling. Anyways, camp is set, fire is going, but it's getting lower and needs wood. The sun is down and we're both cutting up and having a good time. My friend is sitting on this little chair he always brought and loading up this makeshift bong and I was crouched, breaking some excess limbs off some of the logs we had gathered for the fire. All of a sudden, this strong breeze cuts through the clearing. I couldn't tell you if it was the suddenness of it or what, but my friend and I both stopped immediately and looked at each other. The breeze went just long enough to flicker our fire down to a small flame. We both sat completely still in almost total darkness. Neither of us said a word. Across from us on the other side of the fire, we could hear footsteps. They sounded like somebody was running and would slow to a walk and then run again. Definitely on two legs. By the sound of it, they were pacing back and forth over the same spot over and over again. Then, just like it started, it stopped with a softer crunch on the underbrush. I knew by the sound it had taken a crouch. I was crouched still and knew I was staring right at it in the dark. My friend grabbed my shoulder and said, Buddy, and when he did this, I felt this surge of fear wash over me. I could feel it and hear it in him. I had been so fixed on the footsteps and rationalizing what I heard that I hadn't even considered being afraid. But this was true fear. It was raw and made me feel helpless. I could hear my friend after a while grab some leaves and he dropped them on the fire. For the split second the leaves covered the fire, we were in pure darkness. Then the fire sprang to life. We both quickly grabbed more leaves and brush and threw it on the fire. I got some sticks and logs on there and neither of us took our eyes off of the spot or moved much for over an hour. Finally, the leaves crunched and it slowly walked off. Whatever it was had sat crouched watching us without moving for far longer than any animal would. It wasn't until after the footsteps disappeared that I realized the smell had disappeared as well. It smelled like a paper mill, spoiled eggs almost. For the rest of the night, besides whispered remarks, neither of us really moved or stopped looking at the spot. Nobody went into the tent and I had very short, light sleep sitting on the ground with my head rested on my hands. My friend never went to sleep. In the morning, we packed up and silently walked back home. To this day, we talk about it. In the seven to eight years since it happened, my forester friend has not camped by himself out there since. I'm a wilderness survivor instructor and security contractor. A couple days ago, a student of mine and good friend who I had taken out into the woods before told me his dad just got 150 acres of land in a secluded mountainous part of my state. It had a large amount of forest on it that hadn't been explored yet, as his dad was only building something for his horses that took up about a hundred yards of the property, and his horses were free to roam at the moment. He said his dad got an insane deal on the property. My friend is now a dad of three, and I know he doesn't get out into the woods that often, so I agreed to go with him because it seemed really fun and I could imagine he needs a getaway every now and then. We are both indigenous, into cars, into wilderness survival 
and all sorts of stuff, so we never run out of anything to talk about in the woods. His dad, however, told us that he didn't want anybody exploring the woods unless we had a gun. He said it was because he saw coyotes. Now, we're all indigenous here. We were raised in the same state. Coyotes didn't actually attack people, really. My friend, who we'll call R.C., also told me a while back when he was first on the property, he saw movement in the tree lines that was roughly human size and shape, but couldn't tell since his eyesight isn't that good. I brought my AR and a small flint napping kit just for the fun of it, and we set off onto the property. We explored a lot of rolling fields, creeks, multiple natural springs and ponds. Everything felt normal. It was a beautiful landscape. Eventually, we decided to get to the forested part of the property as it hadn't been explored yet. As soon as we entered the tree line, the entire mood shifted. The forest had an ambience of its own, very similar to the woods in the movie The Ritual. The woods were gray and dead silent, save for the occasional creaking of a tall, tired cedar tree. There was a very small stream running through the center of it, with sand that was black. It felt like we were surrounded, watched from all sides. It didn't take long before a very putrid stench hit our nostrils. It was the odor of rotting flesh. We decided to follow the smell and found the remains of three to four cowls. We examined the exposed skulls and couldn't find any bullet holes. It didn't appear to me that these cows had been put down. Something killed them though and their bones were spread over about 30 yards. There were large indentions in the dirt all around them that were very vague in their shape. We decided to press on into the woods. Now we were accompanied only by silence, the putrid odor of death, and the sound of our own heartbeats. We kept stopping at the stream as I noticed several different types of rocks, large coyote tracks, and something else that was large but intentionally avoided the sand, it seemed. We pressed on into the woods until we started to find trees that had been bent over and pinned behind other trees while they were still alive. Something that could never, ever happen naturally. We hiked on and found what I can only describe as a tool made out of bone lying on the ground. It was extremely crude, but looked like some kind of scooping tool or knife. It was disturbing because although it looked primitive, it looked way more primitive than a person would make, but an intentionally shaped tool nonetheless. We hiked on until we found a clearing with a pond that had more large oval tracks surrounding it. On the other side of the pond, we found a very strange little tree structure. It was an A-frame. It had rocks placed up against it. However, it wasn't that sturdy, and the rocks were very particularly placed. We found no signs of any campfires around it. We found no camping trash. This is exactly a place you could hike to from a house. I photographed and made a video of this little hut thing. It was getting dark, so we decided we should head back. I had a flashlight on my AR, but I didn't want to rely on that in the dark, with something that kills cows and makes tools out of their bones somewhere behind us. We made our way out of the forest and back to where the trucks were parked, just in time before it got too dark to see. As we were leaving, we saw something on top of one of the hills that we couldn't identify, but didn't stick around to find out what it was. It's worth mentioning, the previous owner began construction of something on the property, abruptly halted construction, and left. Again, 
To this day, we both remain confused at what we had seen and encountered in those woods. Any of your suggestions would greatly be appreciated. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true backwoods creepy stories. I would like to give a very special shout out to the reformed members of the channel. Cold Stone Wolf, Inner Scare Wifey, Howler's Mom, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, CAG, Denise Sess, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie DW, Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.